following, following. the following the journey into comic 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 network 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 production production hey guys dick here from podcastrophy podcast and you are listening to the best of the journey into comics network where we take the best of each episode from the week and we highlight it for you and bring it to you in the form of this podcast today so uh if you want you know you know, just uh, take a breather, relax, listen to the best of the Journey into Comics Network. And, you know, just do me a favor. Just do me one solid favor. Try to make every day a big dick day. Thanks, guys. And here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Journey into Comics. I had a member of the network who remains to be AP, anonymous, AP anonymous. Uh, and uh, this AP anonymous person uh, said, Nate, why, when, you, you know, when you're doing your show, do you take a, you take a big fucking drink of water or something, but you don't like edit that out or you don't do anything with it. You don't change the atmosphere that you were just taking a drink of water like it's some big cardinal sin he said i I think the exact words were like why do you alert the listener and not just like take a quick sip and then continue on in your thought and edit the silence and i was like i don't know man my thought is this like if ap was in the room right now with me or if dick was in the room or tyler or nick or anybody in the network or any person if you you listener you are in my kitchen right now looking across from me and i'm looking at you and i'm just like hey We're having a conversation. I can't bounce the conversation off anybody right now, but I need to rehydrate my mouth because it's parched, okay? So I just be, I I guess my thing is I live by that real recognizes real, right? And I don't want my show to come off as fake and overly produced. That's why there's not a lot of crazy, wacky, crazy zany buttons and shit like we used to do like I, it was fun and all but you, sometimes you do that a lot of times you have to do that in post i mean i guess right now in the current juncture since i'm the only person on the show and i'm the only person that needs to hear the buttons i technically speaking could be locking them in during the show and making a whole different thing happen but i'm not going to do that right now because that's not what you guys are here for you're here for news and comics and stuff so back to it i am going to be having a drink right now i'm going to just take a quick time out to cheers you ap for giving me this drink break. Thanks, AP. Cheers! Water is a delicious source of life. All right. So I think it's time we actually get into some, like, nerdy comic bookie news i have some things for you guys today some stuff is very much in the heart of comic book something is fringe comic book something is something i didn't even know was going on in comic books and uh then a little bit of movie news and what have you so right out of the gate we're going to cover that brief movie news that i have and it's a little bit of avengers 4 stuff uh first of all uh gamora uh miss zoe saldana posted a video of her currently doing work for uh, Marvel for reshoots for the next part of the inf- of the Avengers story and her costume get up and uh, everything points to it's possible that there is some time travel going to be happening and I uh that being said it's just like it just seems like everything is pointing to avengers is going to do time travel and that's the big shtick and they're going to use time in the word and everyone's going to go the story is a time travel story and that's how they're going to undo the events of infinity war but who knows i'm not sure if that'll be the case you know so my thing is getting into the avengers thing too is that when you're talking Zoe Saldana, that brings up yet as the sore subject that won't go away, and that's James Gunn. There's not really been any new news on this front, um, but that also means there hasn't been any news on this front, which could be good. Uh, I know that Disney had come out, or according to Variety, Disney had come out, which who knows how far Variety can be trusted, 
and came out and said there's no way that they're going to stand behind their direction. But a lot of people are very upset. A lot of people aren't letting this go. Dave Batista, one of those people. Uh, Chris Pratt showed up in a video recently. There was a there's a little kid battling cancer and a bunch of the different members of the MCU and different people who are in superhero roles, essentially Marvel superhero roles, uh, shouted this person out and said that they were thinking of him and stuff. It was a very sweet video and whatnot. Uh, but Chris Pratt was in it, and he looked a little haggard, you know, honestly. Like, I'm just going to throw that out there. He looked a little beat. So uh, I just don't think that we're done with the James Gunn stuff. I feel like really Disney, I just don't think Disney lops off their arm like that and goes, oh, well, there won't be fan backlash. Everyone will still go see this movie. We'll do it right. Like, you're playing with really dangerous fire, and it's it's yeah, this is... All of this is building towards who knows what the fuck is about to happen. And I don't know. I genuinely don't know what the future holds for, for all of this stuff. Uh, I will say that if we're talking about Infinity War a little bit, there were some interesting thing. There was something interesting, a little subtle Easter egg that got called back. Um, just imagery based. When Thanos is on Titan and he's fighting the Avengers and Guardians and then he gets Tony and he stabs Tony with the piece of the Iron Man armor that Tony had went to attack Thanos with... Um, the whole scene is kind of cut similar to Obadiah Stane in the first uh, Iron Man when he takes Iron Man's arc reactor out and, and Tony's like turning blue and all like, <gasps> and whatnot. And then he gets the uh, the little robot, gives him the little thing and whatnot. And he, anyways, you guys know how fucking Iron Man went. It's old, 10 years old. So it's just cool that they had like kind of similar imagery, a close up of of stain and a close-up of Thanos are like shot very similarly in angle and how he's looking at Tony. Uh, the look Tony gives back is very similar. I mean, imagery, man, they're doing a good job with that imagery. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I mean, I will say I'm pretty excited for Avengers four, whatever that may be. And, uh, hopefully soon we have some, some footage of that or some Captain Marvel footage or, anything i'm I, I think it's time we get the captain marvel trailer knowing my luck it'll drop like tuesday or monday when this episode's already out and i've i'm already past recording it'll be like the captain marvel trailer's out holy fucking shit and everybody will be reacting to it and i'll be here waiting a week to cover it for you guys sometimes that's the only bad thing about this show is that we come out on monday and sometimes that late breaking news hits monday but uh sometimes we get lucky in that regard too you know and uh I think, uh, yeah. Anyways, we're going to move on here, guys, because I got a really interesting thing to bring up. And I don't know if you guys even know about this or not. So there's something called hashtag Comicsgate happening. And uh, I saw somebody, I think Ben Kreger from Black Suit of Death or something, or maybe Todd Black or somebody, posted something about Comicsgate and the ridiculousness or whatever. And I didn't really know. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I honestly don't have a clue. So I was just like, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of research on the show and figure it out. And I found a pretty decent uh, explanation and a little bit of an article that I'm going to read to you guys. And just kind of breeze through it here a little bit. And, uh, you know, we're going to figure out what Comicsgate is. Uh, so the article starts, The roots of Comicsgate go back to the beginning of Marvel history. More specifically, back to a single, unlikely figure that you probably haven't heard of unless you're a serious fan, insider, or comic book historian. That figure is Flo Steinberg. Flo is a well-known well -known in comic circles and widely regarded as the first lady of the comics and often the heart of Marvel. She was one of the original Marvel staffers, Stan Lee's secretary, a plucky feminist, go-getter, and the original glass ceiling breaker. By all accounts, Flo was one of the more interesting figures in comic book history. Okay. Flo died in January of 2017 at the age of 93. She was fondly remembered by Marvel insiders by saying, when you accomplish something remarkable, reward yourself with something sweet. A week later, at what was, to the best of my understanding, a sanctioned company function to honor her passing, a group of female assistant editors got together and shared their sorrow at the passing of one of Marvel's great figures over milkshakes a tweet containing a selfie taken at the event was posted on july 28th by a marvel assistant editor named heather ann tos along with the hashtag fabulous flow that's when all hell break loose hashtag make mine milkshake 
Looking in from the outside, what happened next was weird, unexpected, and seemingly random. Almost immediately, Antos found herself dragged under the riptide by a social tidal wave of the most disgusting sexism, misogyny, libel, and hate you can possibly imagine. Angry tweets and direct messages came from everywhere. There are accounts of threats being made, and even weeks later, pornographic memes were still being tagged against her profile. The support for Heather in the larger community was overwhelming. The comic book world, understanding what they were seeing, rallied behind her, as did the general public. Hashtag Make Mine Milkshake trended for three days in support of Antos. Marvel was in a period of mourning. They had just lost one of their own, someone who, according to sources inside Marvel, was regarded as a grandmother figure, especially to the younger members of the team. Someone who had been a mentor and bringer of cheer. While there are controversial elements to Comicsgate, nobody disagreed on what Flo Steinberg was to the history of Marvel and the comic book industry in general. This is a settled fact. So imagine how confusing something that like that might be if you were to experience it. You're on Twitter mourning the loss of a mentor you worked with and loved, someone well-respected, someone great, and then this? What? Why? Why? Wait, what? What kind of person does something like that? The answer will come from another unlikely source. For years, Marvel and DC have grappled with changing market conditions and struggled with the questions of how to remain profitable and relevant in the new 21st century landscape. There have been challenges such as the right of digital distribution and marketing, trying to reconcile existing fans with new movie-going fans as well as new digital fans who may not be, shall we say, the traditional demographic. Simultaneously against this rocky landscape of change, there has been a movement slowly growing in the seedy underbelly of the internet. It is an unexpected coalition of sincere but disaffected comic book fans, old gamer gates, middle-aged edge lords, crazy ex-military type, and white nationalists who have bone to who have bone to pick with just about everyone. Their cause is described by the people involved as a rebellion against identity politics in comics, but also social justice, liberalism, and the notion of equal of social equality as a whole. These people have been on the proverbial warpath, aiming at the comic book industry for some time. And although the top two leaders in this circle, the ones responsible for the bulk of harassment, emerged only recently, the roots of this culture began taking hold as early as 2012 on comic book message boards, or about the same time the birther movement began to gain steam. Enter YouTube. YouTube quietly fostered and abetted this small but broad coalition of haters, turning it into a monster. With the success of Gamergate Wacko and the extreme right-wing political activist on the platform, the emergency of Comicsgate seemed inevitable in hindsight. I've looked into it. It's unclear how many of them actually knew about Flo or her impact. I don't know how it's even possible to overlook the existence of a tag like Fabulous Flo a week after her death, unless we're talking people who are not the people I mentioned initially. You remember serious fans, industry insiders, or comic book historians? Nope, just a guy who turns rage into money. Before the day of the milkshake incident, there were already trashing comic books such as Captain Marvel, The Unstoppable, Squirrel Girl, Spider-Gwen, Gwenpool, Thor, Miss Marvel, Iceman, anything written by Dan Slott, and pretty much Marvel's entire catalog of diverse characters. Even DC titles such as Batwoman, shock, she's a lesbian, have come under the gun. The purveyors of comic gate narrative you want to believe that is not about hating diversity, but they're about only interest in combating mediocrity in the books they read. They do not hate per se so much as they're very concerned about the overall quality of comic books and the content. They want to make the industry a better place, where Marvel and similar companies can tap into huge markets of people who, are no, who, do, who no longer read the books. At least superficially, that sounds like a reasonable argument, even a compelling one. Who wouldn't want better comics? The argument appeals to the more sincere instincts of the most comic fans, which is why it's framed this way. But let's be real for a minute. There are plenty of mediocre comic books about straight white men that these guys don't even talk about. Even now, as the movement has grown and more channels are covering more things, they still generally don't cover them, like, ever. And who's ever heard of fixing an industry about uh, an industry by lobbying sexist, homophobic attacks in the general direction of anyone involved? Their, quote-unquote, criticisms are almost always centered on diverse Marvel titles, 
But Valiant's Faith, Images Saga, IDW's IG Joe, as well as the smaller indies like Black Masks, Black and Queer, Comics Pride, um, oh, 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 like Black Masks, Black and Queer Comics Pride have been added, and that's a company, Q-U-E-E-R-C-O-M-I-X, uh, title Pride, have been added to the list more recently. Naturally, it's not really all that difficult to see why people think they're bigots, even if you intentionally ignore it and turn or turn a blind eye to their bad behavior. <sighs> okay, so speaking of bad behavior, one second. Thanks, AP. Speaking of bad behavior, let's turn back to the day of that Heather Antos committed the unspeakable crime of leaving an innocent memorial tweet in order to honor a beloved mentor and friend. By this time, the current coalition of big names in the comics gate community had solidified with their secret Facebook groups and multiple unlisted discord servers. They were able to coordinate a premeditated and well-organized attack on Antos and other members of the Marvel editorial staff. We interrupt the journey into comics network feed for this late breaking edition of poor news featuring Andrew Ford. Two classic clouds have been hanging over Donald Trump's presidency for months broke open almost simultaneously on Tuesday afternoon and poured rain all over the president. Between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern time, two narratives both disastrously bad for Trump emerged. Number one, Paul Manafort, the man who spent five critical months leading Trump's campaign in 2016, was found guilty of eight financial crimes on the ten other charges brought up against Manafort. The jury couldn't reach a unanimous conclusion. The president's presiding judge declared a mistrial on those counts. And number two, longtime Trump personal attorney and fixer Michael Cohen agreed to a plea deal with the Southern District of New York in which he admitted guilt on eight charges and acknowledged that he had discussed or made hush payments to two women alleging affairs with Trump in order to keep damaging information from becoming public at the direction of and in coordination with a candidate for federal office. That candidate, although Cohen didn't name him, is obviously Donald Trump. Either of these developments could make for a disaster week for the President of the United States, who was watched Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into Russian 2016 election interference draw ever closer to him as it has gone along. But for both Manafort to be found guilty and Cohen to not only plead guilty, but to implicate Trump in a payoff that violates campaign finance law is literally catastrophic for the Trump White House. While both stories are very big deals, the Cohen plea is more important in terms of its direct impact on Trump. Remember that Cohen acknowledged discussing or making payments to both porn star Stormy Daniels and ex-Playboy model Karen McDougal during the course of 2016 campaign, as a way to ensure their silence about alleged affairs they conducted years earlier with Trump. Cohen at first insisted that Daniels' payment was made out of his own pocket without any direct or indirect knowledge by Trump. Of, of the payoff, Cohen said back in February, in a private transaction in 2016, I used my own personal funds to facilitate a payment of 130000 to Miss Stephanie Clifford, Neither the Trump organization or the Trump campaign was a party to the transaction with Ms. Clifford, and neither reimbursed me for the payment, either directly or indirectly. In a New York City court on Tuesday, Cohen admitted that wasn't true. He had sought to keep the payments as well as their source out of the public eye in coordination and at the direction of a candidate for federal office. And those 12 words are very, very, very big problem for Donald Trump. Here's why. On April 12th, Trump was asked about the Stormy Daniels payment by reporters. Here's the exchange. Reporter, do you know about the $130 payment to Stormy Daniels? Trump, no. Reporter, then why did Michael Cohen make the payment if there was no truth to her allegations? Trump, you'll have to ask Michael Cohen. Michael's my attorney, and you'll have to ask Michael. Reporter, do you know where he got the money to make the payment? Trump, no, I don't know. We've already learned, thanks to Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani, that Trump paid Cohen back the 130000 that was funneled through a shell company known as Essential Consultants LLC to Daniels, but even the admission still gave Trump some level of plausible deniability. Sure, he was regularly paying Cohen and a retainer to fix problems, but Trump never knew that about any of the details of the payment or what they were for. Except that it's no longer accurate. According to what Cohen said as part of the plea deal, if Cohen was contemplating the payment to Daniels McDougal at the direction of and in coordination with Trump, it is possible the president's statement made aboard Air Force One back in April to be accurate, literally impossible. What that means is if Cohen's plea is to be taken at face value, which the Southern District of New York clear, quite clearly does, is that Trump may not only have sought to end run his campaign finance laws in coordination with Cohen in hopes of keeping allegations about his romantic life private, but also lied about it. That is a massive deal. Massive. Now on to Manafort. There's a tendency among some of the immediate aftermath of the ruling to point out two bits of alleged good news for Manafort Trump. One, 10 of the 18 charges have been declared a mistrial, and B, the charges all dealt with long time before Manafort came into Trump's orbit. What 
that overlooks is that A, even if the 10 other charges aren't retried, Manafort is going to spend years in jail, and B, Manafort was Trump's lead campaign operative for an absolutely critical time of Trump's ascent to the presidency. No matter what Trump says now about how little Manafort did in the campaign or how short a period of time he spent on the campaign, the fact of Manafort's essential role with the campaign is indisputable, and at the very least, Trump's decision to hire Manafort badly undermines the president's oft-repeated promise on the campaign trail that he would only hire the best people in his White House. Trump's former campaign manager has now been found guilty on eight felony charges of financial wrongdoing. You can't just wave that off, or we should have just waved that off. I wrote recently that the next two weeks would be an absolutely critical moment for Trump's presidency, for the broader Republican Party, and for the country. Now in the space of a single hour, two massive dominoes have fallen, and they both landed on Trump. While the Manafort news is more of a glancing blow, the Cohen plea deal is, without question, the biggest problem for Trump personally that has emerged publicly to date. We're talking about the President of the United States being implicated in the purposeful and coordinated attempt to break campaign finance laws, and to do so in service of keeping allegations about his private life out of the public eye during a campaign for the highest office in the land, an office he won just 11 days after Cohen paid off Daniels. It's a stuff of nightmares for Trump and his inner circle, sure, but it also poses huge risks for a Republican Party that was largely tolerated Trump's radical presidency in hopes of securing things like long-term conservative dominance on the Supreme Court or a tax cut law, which can or will the congressional leaders within the party say, particularly given the 2018 midterm elections now less than 100 days away. This is a day and an hour the Trump operation in the broader Republican Party is dreaded and likely had come to believe might never arrive, but here we are. We don't know the hour or the day the Mueller report will be released, but that might be the only hour that could eclipse the disastrous 60 minutes Trump endured on Tuesday. So let's see what comes of this. I know people were saying after this came out that impeachment was definitely on the horizon, but impeaching Donald Trump is not the way to defeat Trumpism. Even after Cohen and Manafort, any move to oust Trump is likely to fail and won't tackle the white nativism he champions. Donald Trump's in Iniquities need no rehearsing here. The U.S. would be better off without him as president. His departure would be good news for the rest of the world. Even more importantly, his removal might be pivotal in a larger endeavor. The building of the confidence in the world's democracies, nevertheless, it would be a mistake to impeach him. This is an opinion piece from Martin Kettle for The Guardian. This has been a devastating week for Trump. His personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, think Tom Hagen to Trump's Vito Corleone, has pleaded guilty to two campaign spending law violations that directly implicate Trump in authorizing hush money payments. Meanwhile, the president's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, has been convicted on eight bank and tax fraud charges rising out of the investigation led by the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Each is an enormous blow. The Cohen plea in particular is further evidence, if it were needed, of Trump's manifest unfitness for office. Presumably, there is talk of presidential impeachment in the air. It's easy to understand why. The desire to rid the state of a disgraceful and perhaps criminal leader is understandable and righteous, but impeachment is just about the most inappropriate and double-edged weapon for achieving this goal. Let's remember what impeachment actually involves. The House of Representatives must prepare and vote by a simple majority for charges which are the basis for the trial in front of a 100-member U.S. Senate. A two-thirds vote in the Senate is required to convict or remove the president from office if 34 senators vote not to impeach the president stays. In the current Congress, Republicans have a 37-vote majority in a 40-35-seat House and a two-vote majority in a 100-seat Senate. Both bodies have become strikingly partisan in the past 30 years. Control of the House may change the midterm election on November 6. That might allow impeachment to start, but Republican Senate numbers will not fall below the 34 necessary to block impeachment. Impeachment is a political process. It is a trial by politicians. Party loyalties and re-election prospects matter as much as the facts or the charges. The only circumstances in which impeachment can rise above the inevitable taint of partisanship are if the facts and charges are incontestable, threatening the republic, and if representatives from the president's own party are prepared to vote against him for the perceived good of the nation. These conditions were satisfied in Richard Nixon's case in 1974. Nixon, a Republican, faced draft impeachment proceedings in the House over the White House's Watergate cover-up. Early in August 1974, Republican support ebbed away from the release of tape showing that Nixon had blocked the Watergate investigations and had lied about it. The fact now showed the president had acted criminally. As a result, House and Senate Republicans were not prepared to defend him. Nixon resigned and impeachment never took place. But the same conditions were not satisfied in Bill Clinton's case in 1998, which I witnessed at first hand in Washington. Here, everything was partisan from start to finish. Republicans had long craved the opportunity to bring Clinton down, while Democrats stood by throughout. The criminal charges of perjury and obstruction of justice were far less weighty 
than those in Watergate, and the process was both polarized and polarizing. Public opinion rallied behind Clinton, and the charges were thrown out. Clinton left office two years later with some of the highest approval ratings of any president. Impeaching Trump would risk being more like the Clinton case than the Nixon one. In order for an effort attempt to impeach Trump to even get off the ground, the midterm elections are crucial. Many Democrats will be mobilized by the possibility of impeachment, but so will many Republicans. Polling suggests that Republican voters are more set in their opposition to impeaching Trump than the Democrats are in support of impeaching him. It's possible that impeachment would be counterproductive on the doorstep for Democrats, which is why Democratic congressional leaders are not pushing it. Even if Democrats do win the House in November, impeachment would be intensely divisive. It might even help the rally the country behind the president. True, Trump does not possess Clinton's ability to attract supporters across the spectrum, but nor yet is Trump accused of committing the level of offense as president that Nixon committed. The charges against Nixon related directly to a way he conducted his presidency was against Trump applied to the period before he entered the White House. Which is a very good point, I would add. In other words, there is no way at this stage that an impeachment move against Trump would succeed because there will be always be 34 senators who will vote for him to stay. Nor would it help to unify Americans around an alternative. Trump would still be the president. He would still be president of a more deeply polarized nation than ever. This would not be Watergate reborn. Democrats may calculate all this risk worth taking impeachment or even the possibility of impeachment might tie the administration up, limiting its option to take destructive new policy initiatives. They may hope, too, that an impeachment effort would mobilize the Democrats' base and divide Republicans, a mere image version of what happened in 2000 when George W. Bush won an election that was otherwise right for the Democrats. But this assumes wrongly that what works on the right of politics also works on the left. A failed impeachment is more likely to embolden the president and strengthen Trump's chances of winning a re-election in 2020. Americans certainly be much better than it is today. The reruns last week of Barack Obama's Tears while listening to Aretha Franklin was a heart-touching encapsulation of the moral dignity that Americans has thrown away in just two years of Trump. But there are very few shortcuts in politics. For progressive opposition parties in Europe as in the U.S., successful democratic politics is still about winning to the right to be heard, about finding leaders who can speak persuasively for credible change, and about winning an electoral argument based on hope, reason, inclusivity, and civility. That is what Obama managed to do, and is still the only sustainable way. In the aftermath of the financial crisis and new extremes of inequality, and with the rebirth of militant white nativism, it ought to be clear that what needs defeating is not Trump, but Trumpism. And uh, Martin Kettle is a Guardian columnist. And kind of moving away from a little bit of Trump news involves a more message from the Pope. If you remember from episode one of Poor News, I talked about uh, the letter that Pope Francis put out condemning uh, the actions that happened in Pennsylvania. Parents of gay children shouldn't condemn them, Pope Francis says. Pope Francis says parents of gay children shouldn't condemn them, ignore their orientation, or throw them out of the house. Rather, he said they should pray, talk, and try to understand. Speaking to reporters after closing out a Catholic family rally in Ireland, Francis said, there have always been gay people and people with homosexual tendencies. Francis was asked what he would tell a father of a child who just came out as gay. Francis said he would... First, suggest prayer. Don't condemn. Dialogue. Understand. Give the child space so he or she can express themselves. Friends said it might be necessary to seek psychiatric help if a child begins to exhibit worrisome traits, but that is something else if an adult comes out as gay. He urged friends not to respond with silence. Ignoring the child with this tendency shows a lack of motherhood and fatherhood. He said this child has the right to a family and the family not throwing him out. So, that's definitely... Good news. I, one thing I've always said about this Pope is that he's definitely more, not radical, but he's definitely gone away with a lot of the preconceived notions about the Catholic Church. He's done away with some things that were previously condemned, and hope this makes change for the battle for the Catholic religion as a whole. So, yeah, but moving on that for uh, some weather news, and that involves Hurricane Lane, which created a steamy whiteout in Hawaii. Hawaii's been having a kind of a rough year with the uh, the volcano that erupted and all that's going on. So this week, Hurricane Lane, later downgraded to a tropical storm lane, collided with another natural disaster on the Big Island of Hawaii when the storm dropped over two feet of rain on the island, including Kalu's volcano Lower East Rift Zone. The result was a rare steam whiteout, according to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. While the eruption of lava from Fisher in the Rift Zone has calmed in recent weeks, it has laid down hundreds of millions of cubic meters of lava over the course of about three months, Much of the material is still hot enough to boil water. Earthquakes at the summit of cloud that happening regularly for several weeks have sighted in August and lava was slowly oozing into the ocean just a few spots as Lane arrived. 
Unfounded rumors that a deluge of rain from the storm could have completely extinguished the state's highly active volcano did not come to pass. In fact, the clouds of steam from rain interacting with still hot lava rocks were the only significant effect Lane had on the eruption aside from a few minor rock falls at the summit. Meanwhile, the rains left Hawaii under a flash flood watch and turned normally small streams into powerful torrents. The United States Coast Guard will be flying over the lower east rift zone for a closer look on Monday. Definitely would be interesting to see when two big natural events kind of collide. Do I have everybody's attention now? Don't want to get too hung up on Cody because we're going to have to get hung up on another person. Maybe oh, the most... Up? Yeah. You, you, do, you do an intentional pun there? Oh, yeah, for sure. Maybe one of the most surprising matches of the night because there were the some things... sleeper hit. Absolutely well said. Sleeper hit of the night. Hangman Page versus Joey Janela with Penelope Ford as his valet in a Chicago street fight. They took it to the limit with each other. There were so many high spots, so many street fight little things. The right down to the product placement of Cracker Barrel. Oh yeah, beautifully um, done at ringside with the actual Cracker Barrel. There was so much going on in that match. Um, between the, the ladder doing the um, I forgot what Hangman's move was on that ladder. Oh yeah, he does the like uh, the torture rack uh, type inverted. In yeah, the inverted uh, tombstone. Oh. To all the callbacks on being the elite. Um, now going into this match, I had no idea who Joey Janela was. Same. But I'm a fan now. Also same. They put on one hell of a match. I will yeah. say one spot that blew my mind was a near botch. The powerbomb off the stage. Oh, yeah. Holy yeah. shit. From where I was looking on like the TV view, I thought that Joey Janela broke his neck. Yep. Because I thought his foot got caught on Hangman's like arm or something when he was releasing him. And it pulled him back just far enough to where he didn't launch. And he just, and I also thought if he didn't hit his neck on the table, he might have hit his uh, like lower back on the last step. And phew, he was very, very, very pro, though. He just like got right back in the match, and it didn't look like it killed him and didn't need a lot of recovery time and got back into it. And yeah. Uh, this match, of course, had maybe the biggest pop of the night featuring another Joey. Well, no, before we get into oh, that. Oh, yeah, we, yep, sorry. The VIP of this match is Penelope. Yeah. She she was just, I was surprised. She, she executed, um some maneuvers that were, I was I was completely wowed. I mean, here's this, you know, 5 foot 2 blonde woman just flipping all over the place and taking bumps and man, she was I thought I thought she was the VIP of this whole match. Okay. I can see that for sure because I, and another Joey Janela, Penelope Ford, Penelope Ford being another person I really wasn't introduced to until this event. Yeah. Uh, but high praise, high praise for Joey and Penelope because, man, they put on one hell of a clinic, and there were so many oohs going on during that whole thing that it was it was just it was so great, and I give them all the props in the world. Um, Ooh, they called back to the boots. Now. Yeah, I just remembered that. Sorry. Yeah. Going to the boots, going to the phone that killed Joey. Um, yeah, it was just overall just a brutal match. And, yeah, the, the, the crowd was white hot throughout this whole thing. Especially after the end, after Hangman Page 1 and the lights go out. Were you guys 100% certain what was coming? Like, was we there knew no what doubt? was coming, but we didn't know how it was coming, and the way that it was executed 
was hilarious. You the didn't... whole crowd was just in shock and laughing. You didn't know how it was coming. Oh druids. my god. Penis druids galore. And maybe the greatest chant in professional wrestling history. Yep. Rest in penis. Well, now going back going back into uh uh watching it and Don Callis is one of the greatest lines ever. It's now the resur- resur- erection. The resur- erection of Joey Ryan. Yeah. I'm just like, man, that is a great fucking line. High praise to Don Callis too. <laughs> Because he is becoming this, like, wrestling mastermind behind the scenes. And everybody's talking about how TNA is a different product now. And the wrestling is really good. They're getting really great talents back in. and, and it's, it's like Don Callis is what they should be doing with Paul Heyman in WWE. Yes, 100% trust in his judgment and give him the reins. Yep. And Paul Heyman, poor Paul Heyman, he's off TV for a minute. No, he's going back backstage. Oh, hey, why did you quit, by the way? Oh, yeah, I, I was just tired. <laughs> is, just this, a nap. is that a nap. Is sideline to the Kevin Owens thing, is that a storyline, him quitting, or do you think he actually quit? Who signs a seven-year contract four months prior and then quits? I don't actually have a good answer for you, so okay. You have given me he's, my he's answer. Just, he's just taking a vacation. Okay, that's good. I mean, he's, he's been doing it you know, almost every day for four years. And now he's taking a rest so he can come back. He's going to get a huge pop. And a huge push. And a huge push. Do you think they're going to repackage him into working with Paul Heyman? No. No. Some people have said online that that's a rumor, and I'm like, I don't think KO needs a mouthpiece like Paul Heyman. No, he's too good on the mic to do it. It would be like, why do you have two talkers now? Yeah. So I, I, I agree with you that I don't they think They should have repackaged move. him with Roman Reigns, Ronda Rousey, Bobby Lashley. Come on. Yeah. Any of those guys. Lashley you know. desperately needs someone that can talk for him because he cannot cut a promo to save his life. No. It's it's really kind of sad how how poor his promos works. He's a great athlete though, so you really can't fault. Great him. great athlete, horrible on the mic, um, and he's one of those guys that his voice doesn't really match his physique. Very true. You're like, so, oh my god, you're gonna kill me, and then he opens his mouth, and you're like, oh my god, are you Mickey Mouse? Oh my god, come here, give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> you seem so nice. Yeah. Uh, so this next match that we got to get into here is uh, Jay Lethal putting up the ROH Championship against Flip Gordon, who had won the over-budget Battle Royal early in the night. Uh, what are your thoughts on this match? I will say that maybe if Colt Cabana would have ended up in this match, I would have thought that the ROH title would change hands. But with Flip, I feel like this was just kind of a novelty match. My thought going into it is that, okay, if they're going to change it to Flip, then Flip can go back to Cody and said, you want a title? I want a title. Let's put the titles up. Ooh. You didn't believe in me. I proved you wrong. Let's continue this story. Man, and they Flip would be so over, too. Yep. But uh, but then going back to Cody's face now, so I don't think that would have worked. And that's why I kind of think they went the way that they did. Yeah, which was safe. The match was safe. Yeah. Uh, n- if not- it was Cody heel, it would have. It probably would have went that way. But you can't do that same thing with face Cody. Man, he's so over now. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Ugh. So uh, the match the match was a good callback match. Like the whole <laughs> I, I see why they put Brandy out there with flip for those callbacks to the uh, uh the um Get over Mega here, Liz. 
And yeah, the whole thing, like grabbing her by the wrist and bringing her around to his corner and saying, you stay here. And then her trying to sneak off again. And, you know, she runs into the ring and puts him up on her shoulder. I'm like, I am completely 100% sold. You know, because I, I know I know Jay Lethal from back in, you know, the few times I did watch uh, TNA with Black Mochismo. Man, do you remember to just riff on TNA and Jay Lethal for a second? Do you remember the legendary woo-off between he and Ric Flair? Yeah. God damn, is that some hilarious, amazing television. <laughs> Just going back and forth. He's mimicking Flair's style. He throws the jacket down, nails the like the knee drop into the roll. Yep. Woo! Back and forth. Oh. Jay Lethal is so. very, very entertaining. He is highly underrated, and I feel he's well-deserving of the ROH World Championship. Yes, 100%. But again, you know, this match, here's your fun match of the night. Absolutely. And like we said earlier, they hit on every cylinder on this one. So here's your here's your sports entertainment match. Well said. Yes. Jay did a beautiful job switching gimmicks throughout the match, by the way. Yep. Being able to discern and it's crazy because and I think that Callis even says it in, in commentary. His voice changes immediately. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell Macho is inside of him, I guess. You yeah. could say it like that. Uh, and I heard this was Lanny Poffo's idea because he didn't want to go back to doing Black Mochismo for this match. And it was uh, Lanny, Lanny's idea. Well, I think it paid off. It was yeah. well executed. It was very funny, clever. Uh, it, the match was really fucking good. Yep. Like, I think Flip Gordon is really in the same league as Jay Lethal, as a highly underrated guy who deserves to maybe have more praise. Uh, and I love that he has kind of become a, like a, his own standout star on being the elite, you know? And I think he needs to stay there. If he goes to WWE while Vince is there, Flip would be destroyed. He'll go to 205, man. And he can't do his flippy thing. Also true. Vince does not like the flippy thing. So mm. you you take out his first name. He was just Gordon at that point. Oh, God, that's boring. <laughs> well, here we have Gordon. Gordon, tell me a little bit about yourself, huh? No, he'll probably have, like, uh, Gordy Gordon would be his name. Gordy Gordman. Yeah. Vince, All he does is go in there and he just does a wrist lock. That's his thing. Collar he only does wrist lock. And collar and elbow tie-ups. Yep. And then he goes Don't home. Dare. Don't you dare do that flippy stuff in my ring. I can't. But it's... you could do suicide dives. Suicide dives all day, every day. Every single suicide dive you can handle. Through the second ropes. Let's go. Yes, only through the second ropes. Not over the top rope, but through the second rope. Well, fuck no. The last person that tried to do an over the top rope suicide dive was Undertaker, and that motherfucker did not catch him, and he about broke his neck. Yeah. That was awful. <laughs> yeah, because there's a huge difference between that one and a half foot. Not really, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> so Fli- uh, Fl- uh, Flip loses this match, unfortunately, to Jay Lethal, who ends the- he nailed the elbow drop at the end, right? Yep. Big big elbow Three drops. Times. Oh, yeah, that's right. He went up once, and then he went up twice, and then he went up a third time. I thought if after the third time Flip kicked out that he was going to win the title. I was like, if he kicks out after this, yeah, holy shit, like it's on. But... He did not, and the match uh, ended there. And then we kind of got to the point where we were down to very few and matches left. Go ahead. I I knew I knew Jay Lethal wasn't going to lose the title then because why would a Ring of Honor waste switching the title on a card that's not theirs? Very true. They didn't really have. Well, I mean, I guess you kind of have something to gain because it's more people talking. But I also see it from the perspective like you're probably thinking where. If both the NWA and ROH titles switch hands on this card, P- 
people yeah. are only going to talk probably about the ROH title because they're already well known, yep. and it's going to overshadow NWA's moment right now with Cody. Yeah, and or, or vice versa, that, I guess. Yeah, and the NWA is just starting out, so they needed all that they can get. Absolutely well said. We're going to fuck the sodomites in the... Trying to get a fucking corn dog. I just want to get a corn dog and I'm, get out of this line. I'm just really happy I didn't see any juggalos besides the one. And and I was like, I looked, I looked at Miranda, and I was like, I see why they're in the handicap area. <laughs> just this, all I saw was this hatchet girl on the back of some chick's neck, and she was sitting down in the handicapped area. And I was like, ah, I see why they're handicapped. <laughs> Juggalo. Do you think they're going to start selling Fago at, at fucking Ruhoff Home Mortgage Wireless Center? Oh, Jesus Switch? Deer Creek? I hope not. I sincerely hope not. You made some friends at the show? Oh, yeah. We had some possible swingers. Uh, Try to lay you. A t- a t- they were, I think they were, they were putting the moves on us. They never got to actually proposition Miranda and I, but we, we're fairly certain that's what they were leading up to. Miranda pointed it out after I I had thought about it. I'm like, are these guys trying to fuck us? <laughs> <laughs> and then Miranda goes, I think they're swingers. I can tell. Because she my, used to be a swinger. My swinger sense is tingling. Yeah, she used to be a swinger. So like, she's like, I, I know how they're talking to us. I've been talked to like this before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like... She, this conversation all happened over text, and she's like, I think they're swingers. I was like, yes, I think they're trying to fuck us. <laughs> she's like, and, and I'm like, it's not going to happen. We rode here with Tyler. Well, I, I told you that, hey, I mean, I'll, I'll fucking come back and get you tomorrow if I need to, I guess. <laughs> like, shit. No. I'm not into that. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, man. I'm not into that. Nope. But the, but we did make friends with him, I guess, because like he just kept there. The guy just kept talking to me, and he. This is, was apparently his second ever concert. Do you think he wanted your pee pee in his mouth? I don't know. Probably. I think he wanted more than pee-pee. likely. Uh, but he just I I just kept going back to the music every time he'd start talking to me about something else. I'd be like, oh yeah, but this concert. And, uh, he was he told me his first concert was the Marilyn Manson Rob Zombie show, and he was like, oh yeah, it was fucking awesome and. I was like, oh, yeah, well, we had Shinedown and Lafayette last year, and yeah, and yeah, and I was, I was <laughs> going, stop talking to me. I kept going on about, I was like, oh, yeah, Five Finger Death Punch, I've seen them like five times, they put on a hell of a show, way different than Breaking Benjamin going on right now, and he just kept trying to talk to me, and I'm just, I'll, all I want to do is fucking listen to this concert, right? and he just kept talking to me, and I hate, I cannot stand people who have conversations while a show's going on, like you and me. I, 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 we talked a lot, but it was just comments back and forth about what was currently going on on stage. Right, we were both we were both facing the stage. I would make a comment, and then that comment, you know, you would laugh, I would laugh. The comment would be over. Yeah, you would do the same thing, and you wouldn't even turn around. You would just kind of lean back. Yeah, I would lean forward. You would say what you said, and then we would go back to focusing on the show. Never once did I make you like stop and turn around. And, like, have a fucking conversation. Like, I was getting distracted by that guy. Yeah, it was bad. And Miranda kept talking to him. Because she's, she's super friendly and she likes to make, make friends with people. So she just kept talking to him. And I'm like, ah, I don't fucking like fucking anyone. Concert. I don't want people to talk to me. Yeah, I don't either, typically. We had that one guy that kept burning me with a cigarette. <laughs> he tried to make friends with me, too. And I was, I, the last time I talked to him was... When he introduced himself, and I said, "Hi, I'm Dick," and that was it. <laughs> Which apparently that pissed him off. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's why he was burning me with a cigarette. I don't. I don't know. I can't remember. I had one alcoholic beverage that night. It was sad. You had two. 
I had one. You had a Takati. Okay, yeah, you're the Takati. I had the Takati and the Jack Daniels down home punch. I bought a really nasty Smirnoff smash. And did you hear the people that that were walking by saying, "This is the best beer ever"? <laughs> no, <laughs> it was fucking nasty. It was. It truly was. Like, it, not exactly the front end of it, but like no, the, the front end tasted good, and then as soon the as you back swallowed end, it, it's like the back end was so bad. Oh, and it was like a Smirnoff fucking. It, it was it a Smirnoff ice, like a type of Smirnoff ice, or no? It's this new. It was some blend of two flavors. It was and... strawberry, uh, strawberry and lemon. It was fucking bad. I thought it would it be was. delicious. And it was not. Should have just went with a Jack Daniels. I ate more popcorn than I ever than I ate last time, though. I know. I'm happy. I for ate almost you. an entire bag. <laughs> and I ate a corn dog. And a corn dog. And I wasn't upset. <laughs> you know how much those two drinks that I bought Skylar and I cost? Thirty two dollars yeah. and fifty cents. Ours cost twenty eight dollars, but it's because I bought two koozies with them. That was dumb. That was dumb. I wanted my beer to stay cold. Drink it faster. I did. I still drank them pretty fast. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Five Finger Death Punch. They played a lot of shitty songs at first. I was like, ah, oh, they're just getting really crappy stuff out of the way. They'll play better stuff. They kind of played some better stuff. I would have really liked to hear Far From Home. I would have liked to hear anything more off of War is the Answer. They didn't play much. They they played a lot. They didn't even play a whole lot of newer stuff. Mm-mm. They played They played too much off of Got Your Six. They played too much off of American Capitalist. Yep. My two least favorite albums. Yes. Ugh. They played one. They played, not counting the bleeding. They played one song off "Way of the Fist," and it's a bonus track. Mm-hmm. So I, I was impressed at, that they actually played the bleeding. I, I, I knew they were gonna play the bleeding. They always play. They always end the set on the bleeding. I've never been to a I know. death punch show. I know. So I figured it was gonna be all fucking, got your six. <laughs> That's what I figured it was gonna be. <laughs> I thought it was gonna be all got your six. Their cover songs. And, like, fucking one song from Wrong Side of Heaven. I really hate the fact that they rely so much on their cover songs. I see, I like it. I mean, they're good songs. Because their covers are so good. They are good covers. I don't care what you say about Bad Company. That's a good cover. House of the Rising Sun, that actually made me give a shit about that song. Um, I still don't like it that much in terms of all their covers, but... uh, Gone Away. That's a great cover. I love that cover of Gone Away. But they rely too heavily on their covers as singles and as for set list items. Uh I would I I would have much rather heard fucking Burn It Down or Bulletproof than Bad Company. I would have much rather heard fucking We did hear Burn It Down. No, we heard we heard Burn Motherfucker. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. From that, and that was the only song off of Wrong Side of Heaven besides the little tiny bit of Wrong Side of Heaven that they played. Right. Um, which I would have loved to her, loved her. I guess Lift Me Up. Yeah. I would have loved to her more. I fucking hate you. <laughs> Prophecy. Stop talking, please. Uh, uh, but yeah, they played The Bleeding, and that was just absolutely excellent. Uh, I love that's one of my favorite concert moments anytime I see anytime I hear it because it's my favorite it's my favorite five finger death punch song besides the tragic truth which that's is, a good one which is a bonus song off American Capitalist you can only get it off of iTunes I think uh, wonderful song I've always wanted to cover it <sighs> but yeah the bleeding that was one of my favorite moments from my very first concert that was my first time crowd surfing was during Five Finger Death Punch too. Cool. Against my will. That's fair. Literally every time I've crowd surfed, it's been against my will. <laughs> How many times did you have your dick grabbed? None. Damn. I've kicked a few people in the face on accident, though. Are you sure it was on accident? Yes. All right. I had no intention of maiming anybody. I would have kicked everyone in the face <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly like that. Like I was really, I was really prepping myself for that fucking pit to somebody to bump into the back of me so I could elbow him right in the fucking mouth. Oh my mouth. god, that pit was stupid, and it was literally like as I said earlier, it was literally made up of all the the fucking affliction tap pseudo out wearing juggalo people. pseudo fucking the the fucking bro core the bro cores corpse core please stop the douchebags like the fucking douchebags that go to fucking UFC fight nights at Hooters or B-dubs where yeah, I, used with, to do that. I did too but I didn't wear a tap out shirt or a fucking affliction shirt no instead I started wearing my douchebag shirt which was made by Chris Kale of Five Finger Death Punch. It's literally a, a shirt that says douchebag in the tap out font. And below it says more than just a shirt, douchebag. <laughs> I had a bunch of those stickers too. I wish I still had the douchebag stickers. I could probably order some. Order them. I might. Start, I love those things. Bring them to the concert. We'll start handing them out. <sighs> Uh, I, I'm I'm so I've I've been very happy since Chris Kale joined Five Finger Death Punch because he's he's been kind of like an extension of the band like he himself is his own wing of the band in right. terms of fan interaction and stuff because he has his own like fan club and all that shit he's he's just the bass player <laughs> like and he's a bass player that's not been in any other band he he was literally like a bartender in at the Hard Rock Cafe in Vegas he's what? just a regular gay he's just a regular gay. From Kentucky. <laughs> but he's a badass. He used to fucking wish me a happy birthday every year for like three years. And then one year, I think it was my first year at Subaru. First or second year at Subaru, he didn't wish me a happy birthday. And I literally, I posted on his wall. I was like, bro, are you mad? <laughs> he's like, no, man. Why would I be mad? I'm like, you didn't wish me a happy birthday. He's like, oh, man, I'm on tour, man. I don't always have access to internet. Like that's fair. <laughs> Sad face. Balls. <sighs> I'm pretty sure I fell asleep on the way home. I can't remember. You did. I did. I tried to stay up and, you know, talk to you and But you didn't talk to me at all. And the conversation died and I was like, Oh It never started. I was talking here and there. I don't remember. Yeah, you don't remember. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> you fuck off. You went to sleep. Yeah, because the conversation kept dying, so I was like, fuck this. Let's <laughs> sleep. <laughs> uh, so we just watched uh, the Predator, tr the, the final Predator trailer. What was your thoughts? Uh, makes me want to see it even less. What? Nothing about that trailer seemed cool to me at all. It looked cooler than the last one. All the science stuff, like where they're in like the, the fucking labs and shit that looked cool i'm hoping to maybe get some more like predator background i'm excited to see it uh however all the whatever that predator the the bigger predator the giant was, predator the, the, i i was not a fan of any of that it looked all cgi because it is and it didn't look good because it doesn't <laughs> and you want you like that yeah i want to see it i want to see the regular predator fuck this thing up I don't. Well, we're going to, so... I know we are. I mean... I don't want to see this movie. Well, we're going to, so fucking get over it. Ugh. Now, what are you going to do when we leave the fucking theater and you're like, man, that was actually pretty good? Well, the only... The only my expectations are so fucking low that the only way to go is up. So, and I typically like any movie I see, so it's already got a good chance. <laughs> I think it's going to I think it's going to be better than mediocre. Okay. Personally. All right. <laughs> That's all we can hope for. I think I think it'll be a better movie than Pacific Rim Uprising. Ah, I don't know about that. Why? I I just I don't see it happening. How? Sh shitty CGI 
You're going to point that out in The Predator and not talk about it in fucking Pacific Rim? Pacific Rim didn't have shitty CGI. It, the CGI was no. fucking cartoony, Blaine. No, it was not. Okay, the robots, yeah, but the kaiju, no. The fucking robots are CGI, Blaine. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, that, that you was can't the... critique part of the CGI and not critique all of the CGI. Okay, so that as I was saying, the robots, the CGI for the robots, cartoony. It was a little shitty. The kaiju, however, very well done. That was clearly where most of the budget was. <laughs> I fucking hate you sometimes. It's gonna be a good, it's gonna be a decent movie. It's gonna it's gonna uh, keep us moving forward in the fucking Predator franchise. Would you rather Would you rather the last thing that happened in the Predator franchise be Predators? No. Because you know how we you know how we tied up all the loose ends of that story. We had a fucking comic. A motion comic that nobody knew about that also ended in a cliffhanger. the episode and then Ashley had to go to bed because she had to go to work today. Luckily, I'm not working today, so I am able to uh, hopefully record you something entertaining today, Um, but it is just flying solo. Um, I guess I can start off by just recapping our last couple of weeks and why it's been so crazy. Um, As we've already talked about, uh, the, the girls are in soccer, Mark is in football, and that has consumed so much of our time. Uh, the last few weeks, um, Mark up until actually up until just this week, Mark was practicing five times a week. And then he had a game on the sixth day and he had one day off basically, which was on Fridays. Uh, the girls have been practicing twice a week and they were supposed to have, uh, games on Saturdays, but being a holiday weekend last week, they didn't have a game. Um, but last weekend, instead of the soccer game, uh, I had my birthday and Mark actually had his birthday also. Um, we were, our birthdays are three days apart. So, uh, Ashley actually surprised me, uh, by taking me out to dinner. And I mean, I knew I was going out to dinner with her and the kids, but then when we got there, my family was there and, and a few of our friends and stuff. And it was actually really nice. Uh, I had a nice family dinner out. Um, and then our football game on Sunday was, our first away game, which was uh, all the way in in Michigan City, which uh, is actually not as far as I thought it was. I don't know why. I, I guess I've never spent any time in Michigan City, which, I mean, I don't know if, if everybody listening to this even knows where Michigan City, Indiana is, but uh, I've always thought for some reason that it was like an hour and a half, two hours away. It's, it's really not. It took us just under an hour to get to the field, but it just felt far especially for a seven, eight year old kid to be playing football, like an hour away from home. It's, it's weird. I, I didn't play any travel ball when I was a kid. So I guess that's why it's weird to me. Um, but Mark's team has been doing exceptionally well. Um, they are, I think that technically that third game, it was only the second regular season game. The first game was a preseason game, but, um, they've won, all three of their games so far uh, without allowing any first downs, I believe is what the coach was just saying the other day, which I I guess it it hadn't occurred to me that they were doing that good. Um, But they've outscored the other teams by like 80 something points to six. So uh, that gives you any indication of how, how good the football program is in Lowell or, or maybe it's not even just so much how good the football program is, but uh, maybe the other football programs just aren't that great. I don't know. Either way, uh, I guess this was a good first year for Mark to be playing uh, when when his team is doing so well. Because, I I mean, you know how discouraging it can be your first time trying something and like your team sucks or you suck at it or something. It's it's a it's hard to keep going with it. But luckily, Mark's team is really uh, they've done really well so far, and he's really enjoying it, and he's getting. a lot better. Like every, every game, every practice, he, he picks something up and, and, uh, improves the game for the next week. Um, the girls, 
are doing better at practice, although they, they got rained out of practice uh, yesterday and the practice before it was too hot outside. So they canceled it. And actually we just got a text message this morning that the game for tomorrow was canceled. So they're going to go like a whole week and a half without doing anything with their soccer team. Um, but at the last practice, they actually, they were participating and, uh, Livy was a little bit more into it than Scarlett was, but Scarlett seeing Livy getting into it, it, it helped her pick up the pace a little bit and, uh, they, they seem to be enjoying it, but I, I guess there's not really that much to report on on soccer right now because they haven't done anything since a couple weeks ago. I guess I, I'm trying to remember if we talked about their first soccer game or not. I, I don't believe we did because I think that was maybe the day after our last episode aired was their first soccer game. And, uh, well, it was... It was not much of a game to watch, I guess. I, and I don't mean that to insult the other kids or anything, but, uh, you know, in in little kids' soccer, four-year-olds, uh, they don't really play the positions the way they're supposed to, I don't think. They, they, they're just, they're, you know, there's offense and defense, basically. Offense, defense, and goalie. So they have a goalie. They have two people standing outside the goal box. And that's the defense. And then they have the three up front playing offense, which I don't know if those are... I don't know soccer, but I'm, I think those are called forwards or something in the real game. I don't know. Um, but the coach had put both Livy and Scarlett at defense in separate quarters. So they didn't play a quarter together at all. They played separate quarters. And they both stood on the same corner of the, def, of the goal box playing defense. And literally for the entire whatever it is, five, 10 minute quarter, they stood on the corner of that goal box pouting. Uh, Livy didn't take one step in the direction of the ball. She did nothing. Uh, Scarlet, she did move a little bit, but only to run off the field to the sidelines to, to try to get Ashley to take her away from the game. Cause she didn't want to play it. So I don't know. They, they both got in trouble that day, but they didn't really treat it like they were in trouble. The, their version of being in trouble was we made them help us clean the house. And surprisingly, they seemed to enjoy cleaning the house. So I guess that's not much of a punishment either. We, we're really at a loss for uh, for how we're going to get the kids to participate in these sports when they they don't seem to have any interest. Well, Livy and Scarlett specifically. Mark, Mark has been doing better in the sports uh, since his his first time playing soccer, he wasn't all that interested, but he still gave it his best shot, I guess. Um, he would just get too tired after a couple minutes on the field, and then he would just drag ass the rest of the the rest of the game. Um, but he at least participated in practice and stuff. Livy and Scarlett, I I know it's their age. Like Livy Livy did all this uh, with dance class, and Scarlett actually did it with dance class too. She did it with T ball also, where they just won't participate they'll sit down on the field start crying um at, at dance class Livy would run off the dance floor and and just kind of like snuggle with it's not snuggles not the word i'm looking for she would just run up and like hug her mom or hug me or something to, to just like say oh i don't want to do this anymore and, and uh we on one hand we don't want to force them to do this stuff if it's not something they enjoy then we're not we don't want to force them but at the same time, we want them to at least give it a fair chance before they decide whether they like it or not. That's that's been a a big issue we've had in this household is how to how to just get the kids to try things, you know, whether it's sports or or Mark for instance is a very picky eater and 9 times out of 10 when we bring a new food to him, he will just oh, I don't like that and we have to ask, "Well, did you ever try it before?" "Well, no." And then and then it's a big fight to get them to even just taste it, you know? Uh, I know when I was a kid, my mom used to just have me sit at the table until I until I ate whatever it was that she wanted me to eat. But I'm not sure if that's the right approach either because that's just going to, you know, that like, for instance, uh, I didn't want to try peas when I was a kid. And my mom put peas on my plate one time when she made dinner, and she made me sit at the dinner table until I ate all my peas which took me forever 
because I like choked them down. And now to this day, I, I can't even stand the smell of peas. So I feel like that approach, the, the forcing them to try it, uh, almost has the opposite effect of what you want. You know, they're not going to enjoy it if they're in trouble. So it's, I've, I've tried a few different methods of like, not literally, but, but, uh, you know, figuratively sugarcoating it to make it easier on them, you know, make it more fun. Like for instance, the girls at soccer practice, the, the one day that they had a good soccer practice, we took them out for ice cream and, that was a, a reward. And we told them that before practice started. It was, hey, if you guys do good and you practice like you're supposed to, we'll go out for ice cream. But I, I don't know. That approach doesn't work all the time. And, in fact, it's only worked, as far as I can remember, just the one time at soccer practice last week. So uh, I don't know. What do, you, what do you guys do with your kids? You know, uh, I know everybody's kids are picky about something. Everybody's. Um, whether it's trying new foods, whether it's trying a new sport, whether it's riding their bike, trying to get them to play outside, ride their bike or whatever it is. Uh, every kid, there's every kid has something that they don't want to do. And I'm curious to hear what you do with your kids to get them to do those things. And how has it worked? What's the success rate, you know? Um, cause that's, that's something that, uh, hopefully in the next couple episodes we can give a better report on because I, that's, I know that's something a lot of parents struggle with. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of what else we can talk about with, uh, well, what else I can talk about with the soccer and football. And I think I'm running out there. Um, I guess moving on from sports, let me take a sip of my drink real quick. My mouth's getting dry. Uh, moving on from sports. Um, we briefly, briefly talked about it in the last episode. Um, and I wanted to get more into it this week. Uh, but we had Mark's birthday party this past Monday. And, uh, the last few years for Mark's birthday, we've done, uh, a couple of, well, I guess it's been the same thing every year, but a couple different ways to do the same thing. Uh, there's this company near us called Funflatables, which is just a store. They, they buy a storefront or rent a store. I don't know what they do. That's not none of my business. But they get a storefront, and they just buy a bunch of bounce houses, and then they just blow them up in this big room, and you go in, you sign a waiver, you pay 8 bucks, and your kid can go and jump on all the bounce houses all day. Um, this Funflatables company also offers party packages where they have party rooms in the back of their store, and... Uh, you know, you sign up for the party package. It includes a certain number of kids. And then you, the kids can bounce for, I think it's like an hour and a half or two hours or something. Uh, and then they go into the party room for pizza, which I, the last time we did the party package, the pizza was included in the party package. But unbeknownst to us, the pizza was literally, they, they just ordered Pizza Hut pizza. Um, and they brought the Pizza Hut in. And then... You know, you're allowed to bring your own cakes and stuff, and then you do the presents and stuff. But then after the kids finish their cake and and opening presents and everything, they're not allowed back on the bounce houses anymore. They they that's it. You're done. You got to go. And I mean the the party package price is it's a little expensive, uh, and I I felt like it wasn't a good value. So what we started, well, what me and my ex started doing a couple years back, um, was next door to the fun flatables, there's actually a McDonald's. So we would have all the kids meet at the McDonald's ahead of time. And, uh, we would get them and, and we, me and Ashley, uh, well, Mark's mom did this, uh, last year also. And me and Ashley helped chipping in for, for everything. Um, but we bought the, all the kids that came to the party, we bought them each a happy meal. So we all ate, uh, somebody brought cupcakes or a cake or something. So then we had cupcakes, Mark opened his presents all at McDonald's. Then everybody would, everybody would hop over to Funflatables a couple doors down and we would pay for all the kids to get in. And then they just jumped until they were done, you know, and then the parents would just pick them up and they'd leave one by one until there was nobody left. And that was it. That was the end of the party. It's time for brews with dudes.
Ah, juicy. But it's a double dry hopped IPA. Um, kind of follows the Nugget series that it's already started at, but it was kind of a a welcome addition to the ones that we were already going to buy that weekend. Does have the eight percent base or the ten percent base? I think this is the eight, seven, seven, oh. seven. So, I believe well, they said too that this is going to be uh, one that they distribute. Good, because oh, it's super tasty. Cool. And on the fourteenth, I guess the first hundred and fifty people in line get a free sixth anniversary glass. Oh, well, hell yeah! So I guess I might have to so, find my way there. So guess where I'm going to be? If anyone's going there. You want to pick me up some stuff? Try to snag an extra. Yeah. I guess they're on you sale for here. like 10 bucks. <laughs> if first, text will drink all your beer. <laughs> if they're not the first 150, I think they're only like 10 bucks or something like that. So, This year, War Dog has jumped into the fray. Welcome, <laughs> sir. Also, what else do we got going on here? Um, There's no Zoom. so No, know. it's hard to. It'd be cool if we could just. <laughs> That'd be sweet. Use the I don't think that's a thing, though. We, we, we've, we've fallen behind. I saw you, Jimmy Ramos. Ramos. Kind of hops you got in this I've bitch. already mispronounced one. Ramos. Last name. Let's name. Let's Double dry hop with Citra name. and Mosaic. On purpose. Yeah. Yes. There we go. Citra and Mosaic. All right. All right, guys. Well, let's see what we got here. Cheers. Oh, oh hell yeah. That smells amazing. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Throw stone coleum. Oh, that's delicious. Um, that is very delicious. Wow. They didn't put much of that, much bittering hops in there. That's nope. all on the back end. Oh, nope. hell yeah. That's juice. Nope. <laughs> that's beer thought it was getting away with it, and then it got its ass whooped for it, and it was getting ready to walk out yeah. the door. It's got like a Juice Busters vibe. Mm -hmm. like it's kind of mellow. I like it, though. For a seven, that's easy to drink. That's probably dangerous. Yes, it is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sure is, my friend. 7% ABV. Mmm. Their can art is just ridiculous. I I've never met. Kind of like that, like the four twenty, and not four twenty. It was like that, the rain or whatever. What was that from the four twenty release? Uh, Gosh darn uh, it! The four twenty juice or yeah, I think it was the four twenty juice. Yeah. That reminds me of that. Oh, it's yeah, like a really light. Clouds, yeah, yeah. it's like really light in color and yeah. not like super mm -hmm. alcoholic. Yeah, that's that's dangerous because that's really heavy but really light. At the same time, mm. double dry hopped IPA, Citra, very popular right now. <laughs> That's so in mosaic. Put that in everything. It's delicious. <laughs> that mosaic's so hot right now. <laughs> like Hansel, the Hansel. He's so hot right now. <laughs> this is Ooh. fantastic. I like that, and that's actually. Surprisingly, I wasn't going to buy it because I was there for a select three, mm -hmm. and then that got bumped up to five, <laughs> and then that got bumped up to six. Oh, but yeah. I'll that's how that happened. Okay, heck, I'll load your wallet up right now if you want to yeah. go down there. <laughs> say, what did you what did you get? But it sounds like you got everything. Yeah, we went in for the fountains of juice, um, the pineapple cherry slushy. That one is amazing. It's so light though, like it's, it doesn't. It's not it's sharp. Not yeah. yeah, it doesn't like. It just it beat you. It's like a juice. maraschino cherry. Oh, damn. And beer, which I, in any other sense that would be a horrible the combination. Four and a half percent base or yeah, yeah, yeah. nice, super soft. It's about like it's just like one of these, but it was just really no, smooth. It's not very tart. Yeah, yeah. It's very very smooth. I think it's just because it's a lot of sugary. And this one's only a four point five, so. Yeah, the four point five base they have is. I'm still digging awesome. that double mango Whatever. milkshake though. That thing is insane. That is very very good. I fell off that 450 bus pretty hard. Yeah. Why don't you got this dang job, Nick? I know, man. Yeah, you <laughs> suck. <laughs> suck. Uh, I had fridges full of 450 for so long. <laughs> Just making it rain on stop. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was great. <laughs> yeah, I got. Our then I got a, a decent job. It's it's God. pretty. <laughs> It's pretty bad that your refrigerator Making has <laughs> little to no room for leftovers or actual groceries. No, it's it's. it's I've got too many fridges full, and the other fridge is, it's getting there. <laughs> Hello, we, Tia. Welcome. She Ty, just Ty joined of, us on Facebook Live. Tia, Tia Voit, Tia Wright, Tia oh, Rit. But we're gonna mispronounce rigged, on purpose, right? Rigged, rigged, rigged. We're rigged, rigged. <laughs> like Knigget. Oh my goodness. Who else we got here? Michael Montalvo, Keith Sorensen, Paul oh, wait. Powell. That's my buddy Mike from Colorado. 
I'm gonna say hi to or you. Oregon. Sorry, Oregon. Oh man, send us some beers, Mike. Oh, we've already, <laughs> we've already, no, we've already <laughs> talked about. I'm gonna get a whale pod and send it out his way. Uh, I might just like send myself out his way. <laughs> I'm, if I'm I'll take load, my body to load him. this down. Yeah, <laughs> we found out. So apparently, USPS and UPS will not ship beer, but FedEx, they're all about it. Cool. Yeah, we sent some to Mississippi and then got this beer that we're going to try next from them, from Yellow Wagon Brew. He's on Instagram. Really good nice. juice. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. This is a nice guy. And he shipped it. He even showed me a link on like how to ship beer properly but safely. And nice. yeah, he was he was really informative, and it was like an yeah, awesome like trade. On the edge. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm just going to let these get warm. Screw you. <laughs> Once upon a Christmas, I uh, bought a <coughs> six pack or something of zombie dust from from Three Floyds themselves. And I went home, and one of them wasn't really full. All, two of them weren't really full all the way. Like the next didn't have any beer in them. So I just sent him a picture, just being like, "Hey guys, um, I, I missed I missed a little bit of my beer." They sent me a whole case, nice in the mail. I'm like, "These are all." Three Floyds, we love you. Release more wax tops, please. Ooh, yes, because it's been, it's been it's been a dry season. No barrel aged behemoth. Come on, so that hurt me this year. It is. I yeah. <laughs> wanted some of that real bad. This is a love letter. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we all just please. put our hands together? And please. Please. please, more wax tops. <laughs> Consistently. Ooh. I need that Chevalier. Make that nonstop. <laughs> I guess Brett was talking about bringing back his uh, Dark Lords down to one of the community shares mm-hmm. for four fifty. That's an excellent idea. They need stuff like that. Maybe this next one will be the one. I got one there Why called the <laughs> um, Extra Extra Knuckle. I can't remember what brewery it was from, but the can art alone, I was like, I'm stealing the can. You think I'm sold on this? Yeah. They had Mirror Mask. I can't remember what that one's from either because we drank a lot that day. I'm not gonna lie. I had was... a Southern Grist beer today. I said, insert juicy pun here. Ooh, that's good. And, uh, yeah, they're from Asheville. We should go to Asheville. It's, <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Southern Grist. Everyone go check that out. If you're in Asheville or nearby, please send it here. <laughs> we just got back from North Carolina, and I didn't get to go anywhere Ooh. fun. Oh, man. That's, that's... What, is, what was the point? Well, okay, so we went. Were you near we Asheville? flew to Maryland. <laughs> drove, Come on, man. Drove from Maryland through Virginia to North Carolina. We stayed at a, a family friend's uh house for Katie's family and then we finished our drive down to South Carolina stayed in Myrtle for 10 days and then came back up through to Maryland and then went home I didn't really get to drink many local beers while we were there but I was on the beach for 10 days so I'm not bitching that sounds amazing I love me some beach time everything except the jellyfish fuck jellyfish no they're the bees of the sea those little bastards fucking dicks welcome Cody Hall and Eric Oldman it is a rather nice shirt, isn't it, Eric? Wearing a oh, Sons like of Raw. Um, yeah. Cannot, there's no way they can read this. <laughs> yeah. Points to anyone. Torn the fuck apart. <laughs> there's no way. There's just, there's no way. Unless it's those. Excellent. <laughs> there's a guy ripping a bong in the background. I never saw that. Oh, yeah. Dude, dude chugging, dude ripping a bong. And the other, I think one of the guys just feasting on this fucking like, oil drum full of guts and gore. Looks like really good band. You guys check them out. Torn the fuck apart. They're fantastic. Oh, oh my god, they're so Poster good. Poster that would you use for the haunt. Also, don't <laughs> don't forget check out Sons of Raw. They're they're amazing as well. And Upland Brewing Company, Eric over there. The ironic part of this shirt is it says free time on the back, and I don't have any of that ever. I understand that. <laughs> I understand that. I have to keep working a job so I have money for beer, and then the beer makes me not want to go to work. But I, but That's I, why I keep inviting my friends over to drink my beer. It's a teeter like, totter. It's a so very <laughs> it's it's a teeter totter. It just kind of it's like oh, I gotta stay balanced. Keep one mm. on both sides. I just like <laughs> giving beer, so that's I I enjoy that quite a bit. <laughs> it makes them open the beer in front of me, and then I drink it as well. Uh, maybe it's just the end game for me, but whatever. I like any other people happy as well. <laughs> <laughs> we are dudes who like brew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> T-shirt. You can make other dudes like brews. That's a it's a pretty good virus to inflict on someone. If you can get someone to like a good sour, you've got you've got salesmanship. If you can sell a sour to somebody who doesn't drink them, mm. 
I remember the first time I had a sour, I was appalled. I was like, this is not beer. This is awful. But that was when I wasn't really drinking a lot of good beer. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember who made it or where it was. We had some college bar in Ohio. We were working some gig, and I was like, I'm looking for something weird. And that's what they gave me. And I'm like, uh, this is like 2013. So it was like a long way before I was really into good beer. It was awful, but now I'm, I'm about it. I love sours. Yeah, and then like you and just went to like up on that one time. And you're like, sours are okay. Tried the gamut. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn, yeah. that's fucking awesome. Between four people, we got two flights. And I think they had like six or seven apiece. So we just had like an unbelievable amount of sours from Upland. I love Upland. They're good beer. Yeah. Woodshop's a good place. <laughs> Welcome Kevin Ferger joining us on Facebook Live. Also, thank you to everyone listening to the podcast wherever you are. Uh, it's, if you're listening to this on the podcast, that would make it Saturday, September seventh. Um, so, hope you're having a great weekend. Hope you're uh, at our show. Yeah, Tex and, I, <laughs> Tex and I here will be at the Shakedown Four in. Mulberry, the great town of Mulberry. Gotta love Mulberry. Um, there's a fuck ton of bands. Get there early. There's gonna be a lot of traffic. Mulberry is a hopping place. Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, we're actually going to be um, doing a special episode of Brews with Dudes at the Shakedown this weekend. Nice. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> we're gonna do some Brews with Bands segments. So, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Ever expand. Always. There's always another idea. Building. Uh, we'll also be, for anyone who's listening who will be attending or is a Doom Room fan, the Doom Room will be live streaming the entire event, much like we're doing now. So, even if you can't make it for some stupid fucking awful reason, then you can <laughs> watch it in the comfort of wherever you're at. Just once. No. Just this one <laughs> fucking time. Look deep into the camera. <laughs> zoom in. Like, zoom in Eric style. I <laughs> really need somebody to zoom for us. <laughs> still, like a, we're still waiting to get a producer yeah. <laughs> to sit over there and deal with all the zooming. <laughs> for now. He's going back in the room with all the screens. Yep. <laughs> Got this. Right there. Next face. So what's um, <laughs> all these glasses. They don't look very full at all. No. <laughs> What do, we, These, what do we want to do next? My dudes are brewless glasses. Mm. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> <laughs> And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight <laughs> on this very <laughs> underwhelming episode of Brews <laughs> with Dudes. Tex had a tantrum and uh, ruined everything. <laughs> yeah, we're going to fight <laughs> and light fire to the room. So we, had an idea. we might as well keep it streaming for that. Let's go back oh, to the sour. Get that guitar out of here for that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we got? what do we got next? Eric, you look well, like you're prepping us something tasty. Yeah. Since this stuff sits, it's kind of uh, meaty. So yeah, I like that. It, it got some chunkage to it. Yeah, it's got, it's got some heft. From the looks of it, I wouldn't mind the chunks. No. From fruit cocktail. Mm. This is a Ooh. fruit cocktail slushy. Where was I this weekend? Uh, Half Moon in Kokomo. And they had a fruit cocktail IPA. And it was Juicy. Shut awesome. up. This the one's Half Moon Brewery in Kokomo. Good people. Their food is phenomenal, too. Yeah? They've got this Cajun chicken fettuccine. Ooh. Damn it. I, I, I went hungry, and I looked at the whole menu, and I was ready to order everything. When it came time, I ordered the same thing I ordered the time before. That fettuccine, because it's so good. I can't not. <laughs> so if you're in the great city of Kokomo, check out Half Moon Brewery. And restaurant, I think. I'm not terribly sure. Hey. We are not sponsored by Half Moon. You can literally That'd say be tight if we were. the great town <laughs> of anywhere except Logan's Port. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, moon. Camera In India, you got to head to Moon Town sometime soon. <laughs> Camera Couch, Rita Dean just joined in. Welcome to the fracas. fracas. Hope y'all are doing well. It's been a while. I just got a text for the raspberry apricot imperial sour that i gave my friend and he Ooh. said it's effing delicious good oh yeah sounds good effing delicious. i'm happy for him it's literally double one of these it's just a 8.0 mm. oh hell monster. yeah but it drinks just like this one this looks